Madeline Anderson, would you come join us? One of the things that struck me with all three of these pieces of work uh, by Madeline was how much has stayed the same, unfortunately. So many of the issues, the militarization of the police, the economic disparities in terms of education, the lack of jobs, right? The, the um, intimidation of unionizing. All these things are still going on today. And Madeline Anderson had the foresight and the wisdom to know that this was going to be an issue that we were going to still be talking about today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to just give a little background on you again, OK? In the 1950s, it was only white men making films. Still, trailblazing Madeline Anderson had known since she was in high school that she wanted to be a filmmaker. She wanted to show another side of black history and make films about the achievements of contemporary black Americans. In her first film as a director, Integration Report Number 1, which we saw, Ms. Anderson documented events that led up to the March on Washington in 1963 making her one of the first black women to make a documentary film. Since then, she went on to produce I Am Somebody, the first half-hour documentary directed by an African-American unionized female director, and then went on to be the first female editor to work in public television as a union editor as well, and then executive produced the public television series Infinity Factory. Madeline Anderson. And Madeline, I want to tell you that we're still um, airing you from my radio show from last week. She was on my on Creatively Speaking on the air, and now this week we're re-airing you. So if, if you turned on Black Hole Radio right now, you'd hear yourself. <laughs> but we did a, we had a great um, conversation last week with Charles Hobson and Warrington Hudlin. Yes, so all these people who have looked up to Marilyn and worked with Mad Madeline and have worked with Madeline and, and look up to your work. And um, here we are honoring you tonight. Want to get questions first? Okay. We want to get questions first. So those of you in the audience who have a question or comment for Madeline, um, I, I have a question. <laughs> um, when we were on the radio show, you talked a little bit about your experience um, as becoming part of the union and what it took for you to become part of the union. Could you tell the audience a little bit about that process? Um, when I tried to get into the union in the 1950s, after I made Integration Report 1, there was a great deal of resistance in the film editors union, there were a thousand members, only 10 were women, and only one was an African American woman, and I would have been the second. And there was great resistance to admitting me after there, there were um, requirements. After I filled all the requirements, I still was not permitted to become a member. And they uh, resisted so much. There were picket lines around the local. Um, I had to go to the National Labor Relations Board. And uh, that didn't stop the resistance until it hit uh, the, some newspapers, and they didn't want that kind of publicity, so they let me into the union. <laughs> and, and about how long a process? That was over several years. First of all, in order to get into the union, 
It was a father-son union at that time. And in order to get into the union, uh, you had to be somebody's son. <laughs> and my father <laughs> was not in the union. And all of the fathers and sons that were in the union were non Black, they, there weren't any blacks in there. So the requirements were, in order to get in, you had to have a job. In order to get a job, you had to be in the union. So it was a catch-22. But I had, uh, I was lucky. I had, I had some support. I, as a matter of fact, I had a lot of support of people who were already in the union, and then other people who wanted to get into the unions also supported my effort. So after, uh, the first requirement was you had to work in uh, the, uh, a job that had only union personnel. That was a year and a half. So after I, after I uh, filled that requirement, then of course they still resisted, and it took me a couple of years to get into the union. So who were some of those people that helped you along the way? You spoke about Ricky Leacock on the air as well. Well, it was Shirley Clark who was a filmmaker. She made a feature film called The Cool World, and she, in order to uh, get her feature film shown in theaters, she had to have a union crew. And uh, she hired an um, African-American man who was a wonderfully talented man to edit the film, and he, uh, he uh, was so kind and what, through him and Shirley Clark, I got an application. But after I got the application, uh, that was the hard times, you know, finding other people who would let me work. And I took any kind of job in the, you know, I went backwards. I started out as a, a film producer when I made Integration Report 1 in 1959. But after I saw that there were no possibility of my continuing as a producer, because it was not, women were not, first of all, women were not part of the production stratosphere, okay? And then secondly, black women were really not part of it. Were really not. So, I took all kinds of editing jobs, non-union, uh, hard jobs, anything that I could do in editing rooms in order to gain my skills so that I would be viable to get into the union. So it was a long, hard struggle, but I kept on. I think I just saw something recently on Facebook, and somebody out there helped me with this, if you've seen it, um, that the first, just now, just like recently, the first mm -hmm. black woman was allowed into the Teamsters, and she was driving a truck for the Teamsters film, film crew. All right. So we, from, from you to today, here <laughs> to we today, are. Here we are. Here we are. Um, we do want to get some questions in, so get your hands up so I can see you, and I'm just going to ask one more question question of Madeline. Um, so how do you think we can best start preserving some of these images so that we can have something like this to show our next generations? What do, what do we need to do to, to make sure these, the, these images don't disappear and, and you know, well, start first, keeping first that of, up? First of legacy. all, you have to find them. Yes. Because a lot of them have been lost, stolen, whatever. So first of all, you have to find them. Secondly, you have to restore them. Mm -hmm. And then the most important thing is you have to distribute them. 
That's the most important. Because when I made Integration Report 1, uh, no one wanted to distribute it. So, but I did find one distributor at Columbia University. They had a distribution outlet called the Center for Mass Communication. Yes. And this, there was a wonderful woman there, and she worked very hard distributing the film. And then I used to go anywhere that I could go and could afford to go, uh, concentrating mainly where young people were, schools, colleges, churches, and mainly bringing the message to African Americans. Because when I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, it was like growing up in a southern town. When we went downtown, we were not permitted to go into restaurants. If we wanted to go downtown shopping and spend a few hours and we wanted to eat, we used to take a brown bag because we were not served. So I, at the age of 14, I joined the NAACP. So, and I started marching. So I'm 87 now. I've been marching since I'm 14. So that, that's 73 years. <laughs> so, and we're still in the struggle. And we can't forget that. Because we're not there yet. And we're still fighting for the same things. Integration Report 1, education, police brutality, jobs. Isn't that the same thing that we're in the struggle for today? Sounds very familiar. Sounds very familiar. And Madeline, you had said also that Integration Report, you numbered it number one because you had envisioned doing more. I thought that I made this film. I only want, listen, I didn't want to make big films. I only wanted to make 10 minute films every year to show the progress <laughs> that we were making. So after I made Integration Report 1, I took it to the networks and I asked them if they would be interested in funding this because, I thought so, because it was at the beginning of the struggle for independence, nationwide and, and, and internationally too. You saw Tom Maboya from Kenya. So black people were in the struggle. And I thought, wow, this is, this is, you know, this, this will be so helpful to, for bl both black and white people to know that, you know, this, is, this, this wonderful phenomena was taking place. Let's record it. And they said, there's no interest in this. No one is interested. And we couldn't make any money. We couldn't get anyone to fund it or sponsor it. So then I went backwards from being a producer to now making my struggle to get into the union. And we can't not mention a tribute to Malcolm X. That was so powerful. Oh my goodness. I had never seen some of that footage before. And the combination of how you edited that together was incredible. Um, what, what, what was that process like, and what was the response to that film? Well, first of all, I, had met, uh, I met Malcolm X in 1962, when Shirley Clark made um, The Cool World. She wanted to make sure that she was not offending anyone in the black community. It was about gangs. And she wanted to make sure that she was not offending anyone in the black community. So she invited all the leaders, the core, uh, the NAACP, uh, what was the other one? There were three of them. SNCC or? Uh, no, no, not SNCC. Urban um, League. 
for the NAACP Urban League. She invited them all to come to see the film. Plus, she invited a lot of uh, religious leaders, ministers, and in that group was included Malcolm X. Malcolm X uh, did not want to be a part of any of the other entities, so she, she uh, organized a special screening just for him and the Fruits of Islam, and they came and they looked at the film. And Malcolm X was such a magnetic person. He had such clarity of thinking, and he knew how to express what his vision was so concisely. I was just so admired him for not only for his personality, but for his vision that he, he knew exactly what he was talking about and what he wanted to do. And, I, and he was a very kind person. So I admired him greatly. When um, Malcolm was assassinated, I, th they knew me at the networks because I made a treatment and a budget and I went to the networks and I wanted to make a biopic, you know, a little film with my back and that. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I almost, because I had a few friends that, they were not friends, but they were friendly. <laughs> in, the, in other words, if I called them and said that I had something, some of them would, you know, see me. And talk, we, we talk about it, but nothing ever happened. So, that was nothing, nothing happened there. So then when I was working on Black Journal and Malcolm X and the fourth anniversary of his assassination was coming up, I went to Bill and Bill Greaves, who was the executive producer, and I asked him if I could make uh, a short film and he agreed. So that's how I made Ma Malcolm X. Now I, I, I only had a, a tiny budget, and a small amount of time. And I thought, how can I make a film in this amount of time with this amount of money? And I thought, okay, what I will do, I will make the center of the film an interview with Dr. Betty Shabazz. And it, she agreed, but her, what she wanted, what she asked of me was this. Do not exploit him, his, his, uh, you know, his memory in any way. Don't misquote. And I want to uh, be able to uh, approve of what I'm, I, I agreed. And um, she gave you the interview. And she gave, you know, she let me to do the interview. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. And, and was it ever shown anywhere other than Black Journal? Um, yes, it was shown at film festivals. Um, I was surprised that this little film was, of, you know, um, was so interesting to so many people because it was shown at a lot of film festivals, as was I Am Somebody. I Am Somebody was shown, uh, the, there was a woman, the first Worldwide Women's Film Festival was held in New York in 1971, and they showed I Am Somebody. Yeah, they gave me a couple of licks about that because, because the, some of the women were um, not pleased because uh, Ralph Abernathy said, we're all going to uh, win this together as brothers, and a slip of the tongue. Yes. But you know, he was, he was such a kind man. And he was so human. And the women just, you know, if you would have said that to them, they would have said, oh, that's Ralph, you know, you know, Ralph, you know. They didn't take any offense to it at all. But the, that was at the height of the feminist movement. And I got a couple of licks for that.
But all of your work has such a quote unquote feminist slant. I mean, your work, obviously, you're, you're, you're highlighting really strong women in each one of the films that we saw, and, and they're the ones whose voice we're hearing the most of. And I think that's something that was very unique, particularly during that era, and still today, for that matter. Well, the, I, when I made I Am Somebody, I admired those women so much because their story was my story. I, have, I had been uh, not permitted to get into the union because of race and politics. The same thing. So I looked at them, they were my sisters, and I admired their courage so much. They were so brave. And I really admire them. So I didn't start out to make a feminist film or a civil rights film. I set out to make a film that was true to their experience. And I'll tell you a story about that. When I finished the film, I had uh, a baby like two weeks after I finished the film, my fourth child. And so, uh, Mo Foner, who was executive uh, uh, editor, uh, executive, uh, he was executive producer of the film, but he was the executive president of Local 1199. And it was because he was so interested in films that I Am Somebody was made. Uh, there, they rented a big hall. There were about 400 women in, in the audience. When the lights went down, my husband and I came in. They didn't know I was there. And I was sitting in the back, I had a little baby in a sling. And when those women saw that film, there was pandemonium. They jumped up, they laughed, they cried. They, this was their experience, and that gave me so much satisfaction because I knew at that moment that I had succeeded in what I was trying to do was to tell their story, their story. And I wasn't putting any spin on it. You know, I didn't try to make a feminist film and I didn't try to make a civil rights film. I just wanted to make a film about them. Well, I think you super succeeded in that realm. And I think, you know, all three of these films, I think, need to be utilized today. I mean, I think there's, each one of these could be used in, in every single context I can think of teaching in a classroom, for example. Integration Report 1 is on the internet. It's on the internet in the United States, Sweden, and a link up in Germany. So, you can, you can see it. That's amazing. Questions? Comments? Yes. Would you consider making an integration report part two now? I wish someone would, but I'm, I wouldn't make it because to, to, to be a filmmaker, you have to be at the top of your game in every kind of way, and I'm not, so. This is my grand, these are two of my grandsons here. This, the, that, that's my grandson, Mark. This is my grandson, Joseph, who is following in my footsteps. He's, Joseph is now saying he's going to do number two. All right. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, Joseph. That would be really interesting to see, especially in this day and age, for sure. I had such wonderful support from people who were my seniors at that time. Lofton Mitchell found out that I was making the film, and he came and offered his services. Of course, I paid him, but he wrote a wonderful narration, and he's the one that, that um, knew about this actor who did the narration. The men who shot the film, the cameramen, they were first. They were the first African-American men 
who were in the cameraman's union. And everybody who knew that I was make, trying to do this film, Maya Angelou came to the editing room Sunday, one day. Yes. And she said, I don't have any money, but what do you need? And I said, I need some music for this segment. And so she, she went into this little place that we had, and she just sang it. <laughs> and the men that I worked with were so supportive. They wanted to see this film made very badly. And I'm eternally grateful to them for their support. Marvin Smith a wonderful sound man. They were all American first African-American men in the cameraman's union and the sound man's union. The question is, um, what are some of your religious beliefs or faith-based beliefs? <laughs> Looking at integration part one, uh, the scenes at the church and, the, and that, that was very spiritually based. Well, I've always been, uh, I don't want to say a religious person, but I believe there is a, I believe in God. And I knew that, I knew that if, if you would know my origins, I came from a very, very like many people in my generation, came from a very, very uh, poor family. My parents weren't educated. They came from the South as young farm workers. They migrated to Pennsylvania. That's where I was born. And I always thought there was some other force that was helping me. I mean, how did I do what I did? How? I didn't have any money. My parents weren't educated. How did I do what I did? I, so I'm a very religious person. I believe in God. And I know also, this is what I know, black people are moved by music. Do you notice how the civil rights movements, there's always a lot of singing, religious songs. That's one of our, what would you call it? Trademarks? No, not, not, not a word like that, a more spiritual word. What would you call it? Strengths, somebody's saying strengths. It's attributes, I like that, attributes. Attributes? Yes. But it's also a force. It it's is. It's a force oh, that we power. It's also a force. The music is a force. It's always been a force in mm. our struggle. In our movement, yes. And it's always been spiritual music. It's always been spiritual music because black people believe in God. I mean, uh, slavery taught us to believe that there was something else better. I mean, they tried to tell us that you're not going to be free down here, but you're going to get it up there. But we stopped believing that. We wanted it down here. <laughs> Thank <So>. goodness. <laughs> There's another question in the back. What films were influential, were influential for you uh, back when you were 14 and you knew you wanted to become a filmmaker? There weren't any. I used to go to the movies. I, I mean... I was a terrible person for going to the movie. I, my, my brother and I, I have an older brother, on Saturdays when my mother was cleaning the house, my older brother had to babysit. So he would take me and my younger sister to the movies. We would take our lunch. Our lunch would be like an apple or a little candy, something. We'd stay in the movies all day. In between shows, when the ushers would come this week, we'd run in the bathrooms <laughs> and hide. And then when the next show came out, we, we were in the movies all day, on every Saturday. But what were we looking at? We were looking at Tarzan and the Apes, which was certainly not inspirational. <laughs> 
and John Wayne? No, not no. John. Well, no, he, no, not Jane. John Wayne. We uh, Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon. Uh, and um, Gene Autry. Gene Autry. Western. And then what would drive my mother crazy when we came home, we would be reenacting them. <laughs> And we were making such a noise. I was always the director. <laughs> I was always telling everybody, you know, how to act. Really. <laughs> but I, I loved the movies. I always loved the movies. Not so much for their content. But, and I used to make these little flick books. Because I was always interested in movements, you know, light. I don't know why, but I was. So, um, she wants to know what the relationship was like between in the making of I'm Somebody, mm -hmm. between you and the authorities and you and the crew dealing with the whole environment of the protest. I have something here that I want to show you. This is the hat that fell on the ground and when I was making I Am Somebody. When they were beating the women up, the hat fell on the ground. I picked it up. This is it. The relationship with the women was wonderful. They were so happy that a black woman was telling their story. Because this was, this was very male-driven. The union leaders were all males. The members of the SCLC were all males. And they were women. So they were so happy to see that I was chosen by Local 1199 to tell their story. The woman who narrated the film, Claire Brown, came and lived with, uh, came to New York after I put the film together because I didn't want anyone to narrate it. I wanted what my idea was, but I couldn't do it because it would take too much time and money, was just have different women narrated just different segments. But what but Mo Foner did bring Claire Brown to New York and she stayed, well, some of this, uh, that film in the kitchen, those scenes in the kitchen and the bathroom, that's in my apartment. The scene uh, with her walking, that's down by the East River because <laughs> I live on the Lower East Side. So she came and we went into the studio and I showed her the film. And I said, Claire, just talk. What are you seeing? What do you feel? What's this about? And she did it. She did it. And then I just, you know, we recorded like three, three, four days. And then I made up the soundtrack from her, for, from her narration. That's a great process. Yeah. Great process. So you talked with Robert, um, Robert Williams. Williams, and right. you talked with Malcolm X. And yes and his wife, and these were all radical people during the time, controversial people, mm -hmm. and we're still being impacted by a lot of the same issues, mainly black and Latino men mm -hmm. being killed by the police. Mm -hmm. I think we're looking for some vision from you. How do we get beyond this? What is it gonna take, um, having lived through this era, and now here we are, the same. same issues we're confronted with. And, and this is a young woman revolutionary in our midst, which we all need to be. I don't know. I really don't know. I thought when I was growing up and the end of, local double NCP tried to do things and we didn't get very far. There were only a few of us and I thought Maybe if we had more people interested. And then I left, I left Lancaster and I came to live in New York, but I would go, my, mother, my whole family was there. No one in my family ever left Lancaster. 
So I would go back every year, and I could see a little bit of progress. And the progress that I saw was because there were, now there were coalitions. The white ministers and some of the white politicians were joining with the NAACP, and I thought, well, now maybe this is the answer, that we needed black and white people who were thinking in the same way about equality. But it turns out that, that that's not it. Because look at the movement today. It's, it's so diverse. It's very diverse. And there's, there's just equally almost numbers yeah. of, uh, and, and numerous people of color as well as white people. And um, well, we did have one small victory, um, Akai Hurley, Hurley's, Hurley's killer was indicted. Mm -hmm. That's one <laughs> out of how many? <laughs> yes. But we did have one small victory recently. And he's only indicted, Marilyn, which is why I called Madeline Marilyn. I'm looking right at Marilyn Nance. There's so much footage that we'd never seen. The Robert Williams footage, other issue, other footage from Charleston, that footage from Charleston, um, that, you know, we see the same imagery of the civil rights movement over and over again. Mm -hmm. But you, rep you showed us that there's so much more that we don't get to see. Well, when I went down south, uh, to do the interview with Robert Williams. It was dangerous. First of all, we didn't fly because we didn't have money to fly, so we were driving around. Very dangerous. And I, I, I can tell you that we had some dangerous moments. We were followed, and we were happy to leave that location because there, there weren't any overt threats, but there were threatening things that were happening. Just the same as when I was growing up. The, the Ku Klux Klan was 30 miles, their headquarters was 30 miles from where I lived in Lancaster. And they would regularly have large demonstrations they didn't try to do anything to us, but it was intimidating. It was very intimidating to see these figures in white, and it was, it was always at night. And that's very scary. And, that, and, that, and I thought when I was growing up, that's why more black people didn't participate, because we were scared. But it turned out not to be true. I mean, you see all of the beatings and look at those women. They were being beaten up by the police. And they'd be right back out And there. they came, came right back out. That didn't scare them. I, I, I think you hit on something that I, okay, Malika wants to say, is the, the sense of determination and persistence is, I think, one thing that's lacking and today. Thank you so much, Madeline. You are a treasure, and we're so glad to have had you part of this program. Thank you so much. And I just want to remind everybody, tomorrow we have I Heard It Through the Grapevine, which is an amazing documentary highlighting James Baldwin and his time in Paris, The Long Night by Woody, Har Woody King, and um, Rich Blent is going to be doing the Q&A following, I heard it through the grapevine from Columbia University. We don't want to miss, he's a scholar, it's James Baldwin scholar, who you don't want to miss. So we hope you'll come back and see more. We're here till next Thursday. So please come back. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Madeline. <laughs>